Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And today, tomorrow, and possibly day after. Am I audible outside also? Okay. Okay, good. So I'll speak on this broad topic, which uh, every religious person faces questions about, and even non-religious people face. Why do bad things happen to good people? And we will look at three different explanations, or rather there are multiple explanations given here, but we will focus on three of them, or two of depending on the time goes. Today, we'll look at the explanation of time. Tomorrow, I'll talk about karma, and after tomorrow, we'll talk about Krishna's will a little bit, if it works out. So now, I'll speak today on the time theme of when time becomes unfavorable, don't become unfavorable to the Lord of time. That means when our time turns bad, we don't have to develop a bad attitude, resentful attitude, a faithless attitude towards Krishna. So when time becomes unfavorable, don't become unfavorable to the Lord of time. And I'll speak three main points. The first point is that Time is simply an agent that gives us reactions to our own actions. Second point is, we can't avoid being pushed by time, but we can choose where we are pushed by time. And last point will be, time destroys the temporary to make way for the eternal. So, here it's interesting, the, con the first point which I'll speak is that, <clears throat> that time is simply an agent that gives us, uh, action, gives us reactions to our own actions. So, when it is said that, here it is said, Sarvam Kala Kutam Manye, the context is that Bhishma Pitamaha is lying on this arrow bed. And while he is lying there, Yudhishthir has come before him and Yudhishthir is disconsolate because he feels that it was his greed for gaining the kingdom that caused the death of thousands and thousands of soldiers. All the bloodshed of the Kurukshetra war happened because of, the, because of his own greed for power. Now this is a complete misunderstanding because it was not his greed for power but it was rather the greed for power of Duryodhan which made all peaceful reconciliation impossible. But a person who is humble is ready to acknowledge faults even when there are no faults. A person who is proud does not acknowledge faults even when there are faults. A proud person, when there's something wrong, so accepting responsibility, they will try to shirk it. You know, because of this, they will try to find excuses. But Yudhishthir is so humble that even when there is no fault, he is actually escaping, accepting fault. Except now, of course, uh, every virtue, if taken to an excess, can become a vice. So we want to accept responsibility so that we can do something constructive. We can be a part of the solution. But if accepting, accepting responsibility for something wrong burdens and crushes us, then that becomes unhealthy guilt. And Yudhishthir is being crippled by such unhealthy guilt. Wherein he is thinking that because of my greed, I fought for this kingdom and caused so much death. So better now that I just give up this kingdom. Otherwise, I, when I enjoy the spoils of this bloodshed, I will be doing further bad karma. So, I did one bad karma by fighting the war, but let me not do any further bad karma by enjoying the fruits of that war. It's like say, somebody uh, steals, somebody robs from a bank. After robbing from a bank, they suddenly feel, it's a terrible thing. Somehow they did that. Then they decide they voluntarily go and decide to give whatever they have stolen to the police and they hand themselves over to the police. Then what happens? 
they're still culpable but their culpability goes down substantially because it's seen that okay you you accepted your fault and you didn't enjoy the fruits of your wrongdoing so you is thinking like that let me renounce the kingdom so that way i'll go to the forest and perform atonement so atonement is like going to the prison and not and giving up the kingdom is like returning the wealth i won't use the wealth but he's got a completely distorted picture of reality and he will not be enjoying the kingdom yes he will be become the king but he is going to use the kingdom he is going to rule the kingdom dharmically for everyone's good but somehow he is not able to understand this his sense of guilt is distorting his vision and then you, at that time bhishma dev is speaking to him before this krishna vyasa the other pandavas many great sages that priest dhaumya all of them have spoken to try to dissuade yudhishthir from his determination of going to the forest but he is not listened and finally they bring him before bhishma at one level it can seem like a very counterintuitive thing to do because if yudhishthir goes before bhishma he will see bhishma lying on that arrow bed with all the years arrows piercing his body and he, he may feel even worse because you know my grandsire bhishma is in this condition because of me and how, how, how brutal i have been and that may increase his remorse increase his guilt but krishna still does this because krishna knows that bhishma will speak words of wisdom and those words of wisdom will be so great that whatever distortion whatever discouragement might happen because of seeing bhishma will be overcome by hearing bhishma it is said that saintly people are not so much to be seen as to be heard we say that when we say we want to have darshan with somebody saintly yeah darshan is important but darshan is not just seeing the word darshan means it means at one level sight but at being in the audience of someone but darshan also means philosophy so adhyatma gyan tyatvam tattva gyanartha darshanam gyan artha darshanam darshan means how can we see truly that is what philosophy helps us to see in fact the word philosophy originally means philly comes from love and sophos is knowledge so philosophy is love of knowledge or love of truth so darshan is, so he is confident that bhishma dev will give him the eyes give you this to the eyes by which his misconceived guilt and remorse will go away and how does bhishma dev begin his discussion normally if somebody is sick in a hospital or on a death bed now we would go and speak some words of uh, maybe consolation solace encouragement somebody suddenly got some disease and they and that bit we will we will speak some words of consolation normally th those people the person who is in that situation will be filled with their own grief and their own pain but as soon as bhishma comes over there bhishma as, as soon as yudhishthir comes before bhishma the first thing that bhishma speaks that is two verses earlier aho kashtam aho anyayam yat yuyam dharma nandanah jeevitum narhat klishtam vipra dharma chuta ashrayah so he says aho kashtam aho anyayam he says he doesn't say oh how much suffering i am going through he expands the frame and he shows he thinks oh oh you pandavas how much suffering have you gone through now he sees that he, he knows that he is himself going through physical suffering but when we know somebody closely you know we can just look at them and know what they are going through to some extent not entirely just by looking at their eyes looking at their face we can know what what emotions they are going through and bhishma understands yudhishthir and just by seeing yudhishthir standing in front of him disconsolate and burdened by guilt 
Bhishma understands that what he is thinking. And therefore, instead of talk, letting Yudhishthira even talk about, oh, you must be in great pain, how are you feeling? Doesn't go into that. He starts, completely turns it around. Oh, now how much you had to suffer throughout your life. Aho kashtam aho anyayam yad yuyam dharmanandanaha dharmanandanaha you were the son of dharma, you were dharma personified, you always lived virtuously and so much kashta, kashta means distress, so much distress you had to face and anyayam, nyaya is justice, how unfair it was, how unfair that you had to suffer so much. Now what was it that you had to suffer? When they were young, their father passed away. When they came back to the kingdom at that time, they suddenly found themselves in, in the midst of an of a evil cousin who while a teenager tried to poison one of them, Bhima alive. Then they, tried to, they attempted to burn the alive while they were sent to some other place, some other forest in Varanavart. And then when they lost everything, their wife was dishonored in public. And although they were kings, they had to live like beggars in the forest. So he's remembering all that suffering that they went through and he's saying, how unfair was the suffering? And just by, by turning the focus from himself to Yudhishthir, he just jolts Yudhishthir out of his complacence, out of his, uh, not complacency, his self-induced stupor. Oh, this of stupor of grief and guilt and all that, he just jolts him out. And then he starts speaking. In the previous verse, he said actually how, now not only did you suffer, it is your mother also who suffered. Because she had to take care of all of you and she had no husband to support her. And in one sense, you could fight. But you know, she didn't even know in the fights, whether you success, whether you survived or you uh, succumbed or what. So when we are able to do something to deal with our problems, at least we feel we are doing something. But if we are not able to do anything, then it's even more painful. I was with a friend whose family, in his family, one of his colleague, one of his relatives uh, had suddenly got a, uh, got a, uh, uh, attack and he had to undergo surgery, an open heart surgery for the heart attack. So now this devotee is, one of his relatives was a doctor. So the doctor was also involved in the surgery. So he was telling that actually afterwards we were discussing, the doctor was involved in the surgery, he was busy because he was doing something. But actually when some surgery is going on and all the other relatives are waiting outside and they are doing nothing. So that's when the mind makes us more miserable. So when we have a problem, and especially when a loud one is facing a problem, and if we feel we are doing something, then the mind doesn't trouble us so much. But when we feel that we can do nothing, at that time the mind troubles us all the more. So he's saying, it's not only you suffered, even your mother suffered. Now Yudhishthira might say, okay, my suffering, it's no big deal. You know, okay, I suffered. He's already suffering. He might, not, he might because of his saintliness, not consider his suffering, but he says it is not you only suffered, your mother also suffered. He naturally has a loving service attitude towards his mother. And then he, from there, he is now expanding the vision to the bigger question of why is there suffering in the world? And especially, now the next verse after this, we'll talk about how karma is simply, karma is not an adequate explanation. We will say, talk about how the Pandavas were so virtuous that karma would not be an adequate explanation. But first, he is giving one explanation over here. How, how could such terrible things have happened to you? He says, Sarvam Kalakritam Manye. He says, I consider all this happened because of time. So this was the, uh, till now what I spoke was the background context of why this discussion is happening. And I will see how many points we can take. Till now. <clears throat> so, now, Time is a very interesting concept. Why? Because at one level, does time exist separate from our measurement of time? Say right now it is say 7.57. 
So now we, when we measure time, okay, 7:57 is the time. But what is time independent of our measurement of the time? So I may say it's 7:57 now, but in some other part of the world, in America it might be 7:57 at night. In India it might be one o'clock at night. So when we measure time, we may measure time differently. But what exactly is time? So the Bhagavad Gita explains that time kalosmi lokakshay krutpravrutho. Time I am the destroyer of the worlds. In 11.32 he says that time I am. Krishna. So Krishna says I am time. And in that particular context he says that I am the destroyer of the worlds. But time broadly speaking is nothing but an agent of change. The change, the material world is constantly characterized by change. So time leads to things growing, time leads to things deteriorating, time leads to things getting destroyed. So creation, maintenance and destruction. These are three phases of material existence. And time is the agent that stimulates these changes in the world. So everything that exists is going through all these changes constantly. Now these changes happen at the level of matter. Say we construct a big, say a child constructs a sand castle on a beach. Now the child just puts a lot of effort and thought and energy in constructing it. So now, now what is happening? Say at 6 a.m., 6 p.m., the child came to play over there. And then it started constructing. By 6.20 p.m., the child has constructed a small castle. By, by 7, the castle is nicely constructed. Big castle. And then till 8, the child is happy seeing the castle. And then after that, at 8 o'clock, a wave comes. A wave hits the castle and the castle is swept away. So now what happened over here is, the child created it. It stayed for some time. It got destroyed. Now this change is caused by time. So now in the case of the castle, we can see all three phases acting very quickly. We can see the creation, we can see the maintenance, we can see the destruction. But in many other cases, that becomes expanded. So for our own lives, we may want to build a big house. And we work for years to build that house. And then we maintain that house. And then eventually, even the best of houses will get deteriorated and they will get destroyed. So when this happens over decades or sometimes centuries, then we may not perceive it. Now, when these changes happen, they happen in the arena of material nature. But depending on how much our consciousness is invested in them, we will feel joy or pain. Karya karana kartrutve hetu prakriti ruchyate purusha sukha dukkhana mhoktrutve hetu ruchyate In 13.21, the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that, that action and reaction happen in the arena of material nature. But happiness and distress are experienced in the consciousness of the observer, of the soul. So now, the child, because the consciousness is invested in the sand castle, that's why the child feels distressed, angered, shattered when that sand castle is swept away. But some other child who might be playing something else, we just look at the sand castle and see it swept away. Or an adult, we see the sand castle being swept away. There's no emotional investment. So then there is no distress over there. So basically, time is the agent that causes change. And as a part of the change, I'll not get into karma right now, we'll talk about it tomorrow. As a part of the changing nature of the world, Things are sometimes created, sometimes things are maintained, sometimes things are destroyed. So this just happens by the, by the movement of time. And this we see with respect to seasons. That 
time, sometimes the weather is pleasant, sometimes it is unpleasant. Maybe too hot, too cold, or sometimes it just, it just might be pleasant in between. So time keeps changing things. And say when we when the weather becomes very cold. At that time, okay, Bhavatam Priyam. It's uncomfortable, but okay, we have to live with it. So when the weather becomes cold, at that time we don't blame anyone. Why is the weather cold? Okay, we just say, okay, the weather is cold now, let's live with it. So Yudhishthir is being given this kind of uh, uh, this kind of objective view of his suffering by saying, right now you are going through an unfavorable time. The weather in your life is bad right now. So just live with it. Just live with it. So time is an agent which brings change with our lives. Mm. And now that was the first point I made. And when the changes are unfavorable, we just have to live with it. So Sarvam Kalakritam Mani. All this has happened simply because of time. So that was the first point. Any reflections on this? Any questions? Okay. So, thank you very much for this, uh, making this point very clearly. Nowadays, there's a big movement of um, um, the law of attraction and self-manifesting things. So you say now if you have some period in your life where things are not going so well by the observer, then the modern idea is that now you can change that by, um, by your intention. By that law. Okay. Yeah. What would you say to someone? Yeah. So, say by the law of attraction, can we change? Can we change if you are going through a bad phase by the law of attraction? Can we change what is uh, uh, happening and get something positive? Yes. Our thoughts do shape our situations. And if a person has a habitually negative attitude, oh, life is terrible. Everything is going wrong in my life. Everything will keep going wrong in my life. That negativity can deter them from doing anything positive. And in a sense, that negative thought process can create further negativity in their lives. So, in the same way, positivity can also have a positive effect. That if we think positive, that can, that can enable us to endeavor better, that can enable us to think more clearly, get some ideas, get into situations where uh, things work out more positively for us. So, so there's no denying the power of our thinking in shaping our reality. Uh, the question is, how much is that power? Um, how much is that power? Okay. The, the, that, that, that our thinking shapes our reality is definitely a reality. But how much it shapes? So that is something which many books like say The Secret or other the Law of Attraction, often that they don't get it right. Because they tend to make, Hare Krishna, okay. They tend to make the, our thinking as almighty. So our thinking is mighty, but it is not almighty. There is a lot of power in the way we think. But is it that if somebody has got a terminal disease, Hmm? Can just by thinking I'm not going to die, they will not die. Well, sometimes some diseases people may be diagnosed that you're going to die, but they may not die. But can we per se prevent death itself? No, we can't. So, uh, some say, to some extent, our our thinking can change our reality for the better. But that our thinking is not omnipotent. So. <laughs> The way we could put it from our uh, perspective is that Krishna has given us free will and free will involves not just how we act but also we think. So if we are using our free will positively both in terms of our actions and of our thinking then we are doing our endeavor better and our endeavor better can attract better results for us. So definitely uh, thinking positive is good. But we can't make positive thinking as omni almighty. There will be times when, despite our best efforts, we can't change things. And we need to accept them at that time. So time may be unfavorable, and we can't change the unfavorable nature of time. But we can and maybe change our resentful attitude towards that time. So we can change. 
change that to some to a significant extent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There's another question. Maybe if you can spend okay. more of your time. I was reading in Shrimad Bhagavatam. I was reading in Shrimad Bhagavatam the correlation of time from the atom in that chapter. It speaks about how time is correlated by the sun traveling over atom. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking that the sun has some, um, some say in how time or how things change. Could, could you say something about that? I, I didn't. Um, fully digest the, the whole concept of how time seems like an energy that's moving around and changing things. And, um, it's something to do with the sun crossing over atoms. That's just a way to measure time. A way to measure time. That's just that's that's just the way the Bhagavatam has said that the particular way to measure time, the celestial bodies, the way they move, and the pace at which they move, that that is used to measure time. See, the Bhagavatam was spoken at a very different culture and they had different frames of reference. The specifics may be different, but the principle remains the same. Say, in one school, in one Gurukul, the teacher may use apples to teach maths. Three apples plus five apples is eight apples. In another school, the teacher might use mangoes. Three apples plus five mangoes is eight mangoes. So how something is not measured, measurement is important. So how time is measured is not as important as that, the fact that there is a metric for time. Yeah. Okay. What is that force? Has the sun got something to do with that force of change? The sun itself. Let's see. Mm. Okay. Does the sun or the celestial bodies, are they a part of the force of change? Do they cause the change? Yeah. yeah. Mm. What is time? It seems like an invisible energy. Okay. I was going to come to that in the next yeah, point. Yeah. So, uh, till what time do we have the class? 8.30. Yeah. 8.30, okay, fine. So, now, now this, uh, the second point I was going to make was that time is, time, we can't avoid being pushed by time, but we can choose where we are pushed by time. So, the example here given is, Vayor Iva Ghanavalihi. That just as a cloud is pushed by the wind. Now this is a very striking metaphor for three reasons. Uh, <clears throat> the, the cloud is visible whereas the wind pushing the cloud is invisible. The cloud appears to be much huge and the wind we can't even see it. So like that time we can't even see it. But time is pushing us. Time is pushing giant skyscrapers, giant mountains, even towards destruction. And time is pushing us also. Time is pushing all of us. Our time is invisible, but it pushes the visible. Second is that not only is the pusher invisible, but even the pushing is almost invisible. That means if you're looking at the clouds, actually unless the cloud is moving very fast, we don't even see the cloud being moved. But if we look at the cloud once and then after one hour or two hour, we, two hours we come and look, oh, the cloud is here, it's more here. And so similarly, that not only is the, the pusher time invisible, but the pushing by the time is also invisible. On a day-to-day -day basis, we are all being pushed by time. But we don't realize that we are being pushed by time. So the, both the pusher and the pushing are not easily visible. And in a sense, Prabhupada says in the purport of Jatasya hi Dhruva Murtyur, Dhruvam Janma Muttasya. In 2.27 by the Bhagavad Gita, he says that the verse says that for one who is born, death is certain. So he says that it is not that we will die at one moment. It says we are dying at every moment. It's like say somebody who has fallen from a huge cliff. Now they're falling for every moment they are falling. Now the moment when they crash on the ground, that's the moment actually they will die. But during the transit when they are falling, actually they are just moving towards death. So like that from the moment of birth, we are moving towards death. And this is a person who is falling, they just can't do anything. So imagine somebody is falling, as they are falling from a high cliff. 
But you know, they are just playing some video game on their phone. <laughs> so we, be we become like that. We, we, done, we dumb ourselves to the predicament of our situation through frivol frivolous entertainment, through frivolous engagements broadly. But so even the pushing is not so visible because it is not that easily seen. And third point is, it's invisible. The pusher is invisible, the pushing is invisible. And third, the pushing is irresistible. That we just can't stop. We just can't stop it. There is a whole field in medical science called gerontology. Where they study of old age and they try to avoid uh, the harmful effects of old age. So, there are many cures that are promised. Oh, you eat this, you, you do this, you will become young again. So the International Gerontological Association issued a declaration in public interest a few years ago and they said, and that holds true even now, they said that there is no technology, no therapy, no method at all that can either reverse, stop or slow the aging process. You can't reverse, stop or slow. That means we can't, if somebody's become old, we can't make them young. If somebody is becoming old, we can't stop them from becoming old, nor can we slow it down. So then what, what can you do? All that they can do is cover up the effects of old age. So the time's flow is, is invisible and irresistible. So we can't avoid being pushed by time. But we can choose where we are pushed by time. We can be pushed towards death. Or we can be pushed towards Krishna. We can be pushed towards uh, the repetition of the cycle of birth and death. Or we can be pushed towards the Lord who is beyond birth and death. And that is our free will. How we use our free will. So <clears throat> now that brings us to the second point. That we can't stop being pushed by time. But we can choose where we are pushed by time. Now what does it mean? How can we choose we are all going to die. It is like that the death of the body is ordained, is unavoidable. But the soul's destination is not ordained. It's like, say, if a person is in a car and that car has no brakes and a car is hurtling to the edge of a cliff. And as it's hurtling to the edge of a cliff, the car is going to go off the cliff and it's going to crash and it's going to be destroyed. Now, as that car is hurtling through the edge of the cliff, now if somebody from above throws a rope and the person in the car catches the rope and pulls themselves out of the car, then the car will be destroyed but the person will not be killed. So similarly for us, the body is like our car and we as souls are like the the person present in the car. So, if we stay attached to the body, then we will go with the body to destruction. That means we will experience the immense pain of death and then we will, we will also meet with the destruction, that fate of the body. But now, how do we catch hold of the rope? To catch hold of the rope means to actually turn towards Krishna, to shift our vision to the eternal. So, by the force of time, we could say that, the, that that car is moving and that car can't be stopped. But we can get off the car brake. And that process of getting off the car brake is the process of bhakti. So, that is the second point. And the last point is, the uh, second point was that we can't avoid being pushed by time, but we can choose where we are pushed by time. And the last point, broadly speaking, is that by using time properly, we can move towards Krishna. We can change the, we can change our trajectory by using time wisely. So this point can be phrased differently, but the whole point of bhakti, when we try to, what, what is the essence of bhakti? It's not actually just doing some rituals. They're important, but the important thing through that is mai asakta manaha partha. Mai asakta manaha means our mind is to be attached to Krishna. If by the time 
our death comes. If our desire for Krishna has become stronger than our desire for worldly things, then that's how we can catch hold of that rope. If our desire for worldly enjoyment, worldly pleasure is still strong, we, we may not become fully free from that desire. If we can, that's wonderful. But if at least our desire for Krishna becomes stronger than our desire for worldly things, then it's like we catch hold of that rope and then we are pulled out of the car wreck. Otherwise, we go with the car wreck and we suffer the trauma of death and we continue on the cycle of birth and death. So bhakti is the process of shifting our attachment from the world to Krishna. And this is where it's important that we learn to see unfavorable times favorably. So the point which I made was, I started that time destroys the temporary to make way for the eternal. So what do I mean by this? That certainly temporary things will be destroyed. We can't avoid that. The, even the best constructed temporary things will be destroyed. But uh, when time destroys things, is, is, is it cruelty? No, it's not cruelty. At one level, it's just the, it just the uh, nature of material nature that everything is temporary. But the very temporariness of material things forces us to think what is eternal, what lasts. Srila Prabhupada says in a Ishopanishad purport that the, the miseries of material existence indirectly point to our incompatibility with material nature. That when, what is, that when we face distress, when we face destruction, something which we absolutely don't want, when we face it, that's what forces us to think, why, why is this happening? I want happiness, I'm getting distressed. I want life and I'm getting death. Why is this happening? And that makes us think, is there some other level of reality where there is happiness, where there is life eternal? And that brings, our, that brings about the spiritual inquiry. There are four kinds of people who come to Krishna. Those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed and those who are distressed. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that's not exactly what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> but, you see, practically, even if somebody is inquisitive, even if somebody is needing wealth, even if somebody is seeking knowledge, if you see, at some level, there has to be some distress. Because even somebody is inquisitive, they can be inquisitive about millions of things. Why will they be inquisitive of something spiritual? Why would somebody seek spiritual knowledge? So now the distress can be in two broad ways. One is that our material life itself becomes so unbearable. That how do I live? There must be something higher in life. Or the second is that we have some very deeply cherished material dreams. And we work very hard to fulfill those dreams. And we fulfill them. And then we find that it is unfulfilling. That after fulfilling our dreams, if we find the dreams are that it's unfulfilling, then we ask, what's more in life? Isn't there something more? Isn't there something better? So either way, that is a distress. One distress is that life itself is unbearable. The other is, distress is life is unfulfilling. And then we start looking for something higher. So, uh, the time brings about, brings us face to face with the nature of the world. Time destroys our illusions. One illusion could be that, oh, I can be happy in this world. Another illusion is, the happiness of this world will make me happy. The two are different things. That, okay, I get this, get this, I'll become happy. But we just don't get it. We, just, we try, 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 we don't get it. And that's one way. Time brings about a change in our life. Time destroys the temporary and by that, our attachment to the temporary, we question it. In this, this just a stage. Should I be looking for something else? So time destroys the temporary to make way for the eternal. To the extent we, when the temporary is destroyed, we look, okay, we look elsewhere. Is there something eternal? 
That's when we grow with time. Uh, unfortunately, when one temporary thing is destroyed, we immediately shift to another temporary thing. And another temporary thing. And another temporary thing. And that's how we stay in illusion. But ultimately, time is not cruel. Time is broadly speaking reciprocal. If we are attached to matter, we will be devastated and frustrated by that. But if we want to be open and inquiring, then time can redirect us. So time can be a fire in which we burn or time can be a teacher from whom we learn. If we stay attached to material things, then time becomes a fire in which we keep burning again and again and again. Our attachments, whatever we are attached to is destroyed and we suffer terribly. But if we see time as a teacher, that you know, these things are temporary, they are not going to last. Let me not, let me not just obsess over them. It's not that we don't seek them, because in the material world we need certain things to live. But we don't make them as our life's primary purpose. So then we, we see time's destructive potency and we see that as a teacher. Oh, the temporary things, what is eternal? Time is a teacher from whom we can learn. So then if we have, then time can direct us towards Krishna. Time can direct us towards the supreme spiritual reality. And as we become attached to Krishna by the practice of bhakti, we will go beyond the influence of time. So here, Yudhishthira is being told by Bhishma that don't blame yourself. This terrible thing happened, but it was the power of time. It was by the power of time that all these things unfolded. And now you focus on this implication which will be told in the next verses is, you focus on that which will take you towards the eternal. That which will take you towards the eternal. And ultimately we'll conclude that practicing bhakti diligently is what will take him towards the eternal. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of why bad things happen to good people, the first part. And I spoke on this theme of when time becomes unfavorable, don't become unfavorable to the Lord of time. And I spoke first the context of this discussion that Yudhishthir is feeling extremely guilty, uh, thinking himself to be the cause of the bloodshed. But every virtue, taking responsibility and feeling guilty is good if you have done something wrong. But every virtue, when taken to an excess, can become a vice. So that's what has happened for Yudhishthir. And he's brought to Bhishma, and Bhishma turns the whole thing around rather than wallowing in self pity. I am in so much pain. He turns around and says, oh, how much you have suffered? And then from there, he goes to the metaphysical discussion of why suffering occurs. And in this verse, he says, it's time. So we talked about first, what the time is the agent that brings about change in the world. So creation, maintenance, destruction, these are happening. And time is a subtle force that pushes things to these changes. And... <clears throat> To the extent we are attached to the changing, like a child is attached to the sand castle, to that extent we suffer when the changes occur. So time is simply an agent bringing about changes, but it is our attachments that cause suffering because of those changes. And then second point I discussed was that time, is, we can't stop, we can't avoid being pushed by time, but we can choose where we are pushed by time. So I talked about, just as the cloud is pushing, being pushed by the wind. So the pusher is invisible, the pushing is invisible, and the pushing is irresistible. Similarly, for us, we are all being pushed by time. We can't see time, and we can't see ourselves being pushed by time also. Because it happens gradually, we are aging every day. It's like we have fallen from a cliff, but till we reach the ground, Till we reach the floor, we won't crash. We won't experience injury. So like that, from the moment of birth, we are fallen from the cliff. But because we are distracted by worldly things, we don't realize that we are dying at every moment. Now, how can we change? We can, we can choose where, to, where we are pushed. That means we are like in a car that is going off the cliff. But the, we can't stop the car from going off the cliff, but we can get out of the car. We can catch hold of the rescue rope coming from parachute. And so our body is destined to die, but we are souls. 
and the soul turns towards the whole towards krishna and if our desire before if our desire for krishna becomes stronger than our desire for worldly things before death then we catch hold of that rope and we get out of this karmic and bhakti yoga is a process by which we shift our attachment from the world to krishna that was the second point the third point was that time <coughs> that time destroys the temporary to make way for the eternal if we use time properly we can go towards the eternal that means that when time destroys temporary things that's not cruelty that's just the nature of material nature but through that destruction if questions arise in our mind what is what is real what counts what lasts forever i want happiness i want life for i want life but i get distressed and i get death why that inquiry makes us realize that there, there must be something beyond this temporary material world and when that inquiry is guided by the bhagavad gita's wisdom by the spiritual wisdom then we turn towards ultimately krishna so most people turn towards the spiritual either because the material is unbearable because there's so much distress or the material is unfulfilling they get what they want but fulfilling their desires isn't fulfill them either way that distress which is caused by the changes of time it impels them to look at this for the spiritual so whenever there's a destruction happening when the difficulty or destruction is happening in our life if we stay attached to the material then time will be like a fire in which we burn but if we see that perishability as a impetus to shift our attachment from the material to the spiritual then time can be a teacher from whom we learn and time can take us with every moment closer and closer to krishna and to life eternal with him so thank you very much hare krishna the one question quickly okay okay quickly yes Kind of has to take a time of it. It's, it seems to speed up. It appears to speed up to get old enough. The shashas maybe you don't know. Sorry. The time appears to speed up as you get older. Yes. You know, young people and hours and so you just can't go away. They that's true. Kind of frustrated. But yeah. And when you're old, as you become older, one week you know, like passion. That's true. So why does time appear to speed up as we grow older? it's also at one level because we get more entangled in the world because we have so many emotional attachments and entanglements in the world that we don't notice the passage passage of time it's not always the time tends to move faster you know especially somebody is old and lonely and living in a retirement home for them also time seems to be creeping along it's when we are caught in the busyness of the world it's it's something like say if we are watching a sports match and say if we are not very familiar with the sport say in if we if we are watching ice hockey if we say we go to canada and we start watching ice hockey match we are not much interested in it we watch it what is this not very entertaining not very interesting because we are not connected with it we are not emotionally entangled in it but if we keep watching that match and we start watching it with others who are entangled in it then what happens we also get entangled oh this move was like this oh this person should have done like this oh you know they should win now oh that's what a good what a good move so as we get more and more entangled in it then we don't even notice that the time is passing so similarly just as applies to that game sports game so same applies to life initially when we are children Yes at one level we are learning from life we are children are curious but children are not emotionally entangled in things but as we grow older we start getting more and more emotionally entangled i want to do this this should work out like this this is how it should happen why is this not happening and as we become more emotionally entangled not just in say in our life is not like just a game that we are watching it's like also a game we are playing it's like a video interactive video game so some things in the game are in our control some things are not in our control so we get more uh, we could say children are more like watching a passive game they don't do much they want to play but much of their life is structured 
within that structure they have some movement they have some freedom it's limited but for us as we grow up what happens is we have to take more and more responsibility for our life so we, get, we sometimes can get more entangled that's why because we get more obsessed with watching the movie that's why the movie seems to be moving faster that's how time appears to be moving faster as we grow older so thank you very much shla prabhupad ki gaur bhakta vrind ki itai gaur premanande